So hello everybody, on behalf of Confocalanthroids and Microscope at Charles University, I'm Dalekia Monsopi Kovlibova from the Department of Osteology and Biomechanics from University Medical Center at Hamburg at Dundorf. And uh, Sophie is a former student uh, in, from a uh, high technical university in Prague. And later on, she moved from Prague to Hamburg for her PhD studies. So she will speak about quantum tech, but different electron imaging. And I'm giving her words. Thank you, Sophie, for taking our invitation. So, so good morning to everybody. Thank you, Susanna, for a kind introduction. I'm happy to be here. And as has been said, I'm a PhD student from Hamburg. And in the beginning, I would like to mention that I am part of the Fidelio Consortium, which is European Union project consisting of 14 different PhD projects. All, all the projects are focused on bone health in diabetes, each project from different perspective. And we are hoping that in the end, we will get a bigger picture on this health issue. So far, all the talks in this webinar series were focused on the light microscopy or fluorescence microscopy, which makes totally sense because this series is held by a confocal fluorescence microscopy department. But I am going to speak about electron microscopy today. And as you can see from the diagram with electron microscope, we are able to reach even atomic resolution if we compare it with light microscopy. But it's fair to say that from this diagram, the resolution of light microscopy is around 100 of nanometers. But with the advanced techniques like super resolution, we are definitely going beyond tens of nanometers. So the overlap is actually much bigger than it's shown in this picture. If we compare light, versus electron microscopy. So we have basically two main electron microscopy techniques, which is scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy. Right, we are using electron source. And the big difference is that in the electron microscopy, the optical pathway is in the high vacu vacuum. And because of the high vacuum, it's not really suitable for live cell imaging because we have to use dried and fixed specimens for electron imaging. Vacuum is there because we don't need really any particles or atoms in the optical pathway because otherwise the electron from the electron beam would interact with the particles, which would result in not really nice images because you cannot focus the electron beam precisely on your specimen. So now if you compare transmission with light microscopy, you see that it's a bit more similar than in scanning microscopy because the electron beam is going through the specimen like the light in, is going through the specimen in light microscopy. And in the transmission electron microscopy, we are able to reach the atomic level because electrons which are using in here are having high energy and going super fast, almost fast as the speed of the light. And this is why we can go really to the atomic nanoscale. The scanning electron microscopy is actually not going through the specimen. We are scanning the surface of the specimen. So these are the main differences. And now I am going to focus mainly on the scanning electron microscopy. But in the scanning electron microscope, we have some electron source, which is usually tungsten filament, which then emit electrons, and the electrons are accelerated in the high electric field in the column, in the vacuum. The electron beam is then focused using electromagnetic lenses. You can see how it looks like. We have some iron shell and wire coil inside, and through these holes, there is a magnetic field which then deflects part of the electron beam and allows to only the middle part of focused electron beam in the end go through the aperture and can be focused using scanning stigmator on your specimen. And when it arrives on the specimen, it bombards the specimen and producing 
some other electrons and we are getting a signal. Now we arrived at our surface of the specimen. And in here is good to say that the accelerating voltage is a crucial parameter because with the higher voltage, we are getting higher energy of the electrons. They are going more quickly through the optical pathway. So the chromatic aberration and spherical aberration are not so severe. So we are getting better resolution at the higher voltage. Also, if you have higher energy of the electrons, then you are getting lower wavelength of the electrons. So you have small wavelength, you get better resolution as in light microscopy. Also, you are getting the biggest interaction volume. And in here, in the upper part, we are getting some secondary electrons. Beneath them, we are getting backscattered electrons. And in the deeper part, we are getting characteristic X-rays. I'm not going to focus on the X-rays, but you can analyze them using SEM. And the X-ray, this is basically about electron transition. And each electron transition and element is somehow specific. So you can analyze spectra from it and identify the composition of your specimen using these X-rays but I'm gonna focus on the secondary and backscattered electron because they are providing a contrast images for us. So as you can see in here, we are getting some signal of the secondary electrons. And if you compare it with 15 kilovolt, we are having more and five kilovolt, we are having even more secondary electrons. Because if we are going deeper into the specimen, the electron beam is actually then absorbed by your specimen and you are able to detect only the electrons which are actually going out of the specimen. So in here is mostly absorbed, but if you have lower interaction volume, you are closer to the surface. So more the electrons are then coming out and you can detect them. So in here you are having even the most of the signal. It's basically similar to a confocal microscopy. In here you can imagine you have bigger pinhole, so you get more signal but also more noise. In here you have small pinhole, so less signal, but also the less noise. It's also good to point out that this highest voltage with the highest resolution is usually most suitable for a conductive specimens. If we having non-conductive specimens, which are usually some biological specimens, the lower voltage is usually better choice because so energetically destroying specimen and also the biological specimens are thinner. So it doesn't make really sense to go deeper to the specimen because sometimes you can miss your region of interest. So with the five kilovolt, you have still pretty nice resolution. Now few words about secondary electrons. So they are originate from inelastic collision so we have the primary electron beam, which then interact with the atoms in your specimen. And it practically kicks out the outer electrons from the outer layer. So there is the energy transfer. So in the end, the secondary electrons are low in energy. This is why you detect only the uh, electrons which are close to the surface, because they have enough energy to escape from the specimen and you can detect them. Most of them are then lost or reabsorbed by the specimen itself. <clears throat> Basically, the secondary electrons don't give you many information about composition of your sample. There is some, let's say, like Z contrast of the atomic number, but basically it's because when you have bigger atom, it has more electron. So it's able to scatter even more electrons from itself. So the bigger and heavier atom are appearing a bit more brighter in the electron images. Here you can see this is an image of collagen, collagen fibers in the bone specimen. You can see these cross links between the collagen and we use magnification around 51,000. So this is the classical secondary electron image. Now we are having backscattered electrons, which originating from elastic scattering. 
So the electron from the beam is deflecting by the nucleus of the atom of your specimen. So they are having much more energy than the secondary electron, so they can escape from the bigger, deeper part of the sample. And then providing you more information about material composition. It's a Z contrast or atomic number contrast. The bigger is the atomic size, the bigger is the nucleus, so the atom is then scattering more electrons back to your detector. In general, they have lower resolution than the secondary electrons. In here, you can see some images from Monte Carlo simulation, which is a software. You can download it for free and you can run simulation of your specimen. You can put different layers and see how your sample would interact with the electron beam. And in here, we are have different pure elements. For carbon, we are seeing few backscattered electrons in the red. And when we compare the carbon with gold in here, which has much bigger nucleus, you can see that in here is quite a denser network of the backscattered electrons. This is what I call the Z contrast that you see each element with different contrast. So the most brighter in here is gold. Then we have a nicely silver, silicon, and in here is titanium. And the titanium on this sample is on the surface of the sample because you can see that we use lower voltage. So we are close to the surface. If we would go deeper with the higher voltage, like 20 or 30, we would be deeper into the sample. Probably wouldn't even see the titanium signal if it would be really only on the surface. So this I meant when I was speaking about the interaction volume to think about it. And in here, finally, we are comparing backscattered image with S image. In here, you can see that the secondary electrons creating this topography of the surface and the backscattered image is somehow more flatter than this image. It's because it's coming from the bit deeper part and you have this compositional information. This is the image of the leaf. I think it's a stroma cells you can see on this one. And then, of course, you have some hybrid in between, which is topography BSD mode, because you can play with the BSD detector. You can switch on and off some parts, and then you can get this partly topographical images still with some backscattered electrons. So in the end, this is the chamber, which is in the SEM, so we are having our sample, we are producing secondary electrons, and they are attracted to EDT or Everhard Thornley detector. This is basically Faraday cage, which is getting the electrons inside, and there is a scintillator producing photons, and photons are there multiplied into the electrical signal. We have also detector inside the lenses in here. It's through the lenses detector, also for secondary electrons. And then for the backscattered electron, we have the detector just above the specimen. So the electrons which are backscattering are, go straight to the detector. It's a semiconductor detector. And as you can see in here, some of the backscattered electrons are getting inside the detector for secondary electrons. This is also another cause why you get some partial Z contrast in the secondary electron images. And then, of course, some energy dispersive spectroscopy detectors for the X-ray analysis. So that was really quick introduction. What signal of electrons are we getting with SEM? And now I would like to mention a bit more about what I am working on. And to do so, I would start with diabetes mellitus, which you probably know that is a chronic metabolic disease, and the main feature of diabetes is high blood glucose. This is because the pancreas is usually not working very well. It doesn't produce insulin or the body is resistant to insulin. And you need insulin to actually use the glucose from your bloodstream. 
And there are two main types of diabetes. We are having type 1 diabetes. In type 1, these patients, they do not produce the insulin at all because the beta cells in the pancreas, they are destroyed by autoimmune reaction. So these patients are usually dependent on the external sources of insulin. And the onset in type 1 diabetes is usually early, even in the adolescent age or in the early 20s till 30s. If we compare it with type 2, in type 2, the pancreas is still producing insulin, but your body is resistant for the insulin. So your pancreas is still trying to produce more, but your body do not respond. And this type of diabetes have onset later, and it's usually connected with the bad lifestyle, obesity, lack of exercises, and so on. In general, the diabetes mellitus is the fastest growing health challenge of the 21st century, because at this point, there are 460 million people worldwide living with some kind of diabetes. And diabetes is then connected with many complications. They have impaired vision because it affects retina. You have trouble with your peripheral nerves or kidney problems is also connected with the diabetes. And this all treatments are usually taking around 10% of global health expenses, which is pretty much for only one disease. And what is not so often discussed in connection with diabetes, that these patients has also increased fracture risk. And I would like to tell you more about this phenomena. To tell you how diabetes is affecting the bone, we need to know a bit more about the structure of the human bone. So we are having our bone, we have cortical part, this is the dense part, and then we have trabecula on the side part, which is kind of spongy bone. The uh, cortical part is made from osteons, which is the functional unit. In the middle, there is a haversian channel. Usually there is a blood vessel and the osteon have this concentric circles inside and it's it's like in the wood you have also this circles you can imagine it it's a bit similar and the circles are lamella and these lamellas are made from fibrils and now we are reaching the nanoscale because the fibrils are made from collagen and in between the collagen we are having crystals of mineral, hydroxyapatite. This is where you have stored your calcium in your bones. And now the skeleton may seem it's not very dynamic tissue because it's a just bone, you may say, but it's not really true because there is all the time something going on we have remodeling process, which is always working in your skeleton because your skeleton and bones are actually reacting on your environment if you exercise or not. Or if you get some cracks in your bone, it has to be repaired. And to be able to repair this kind of things in your old bone, you need firstly to remove the old bone. And for that reason, we are having osteoclast which is this big cell in here. And you can see that this cell is somehow biting into the bone. So these cells are resorbing the old bones. And when you resorb the old bone, afterwards you need to produce new bone. And this is the job of this line of cells called osteoblasts. These osteoblasts are always coming in this kind of row always with friends, never alone, and they are producing a new bone. The new bone in here is this white stripe beneath them. It's called osteoid, and it's not mineralized yet. The mineralized tissue or bone, it's in this dark purple or blue. So, and some of the osteoblasts then mature into the osteocytes, which are these cells, or in here, and osteocytes 
are embedded inside a mineralized bowl. And they are living in this, it's like a small coffin, it's a lacuna, and they are living in the lacuna, and basically they are mechanosensors of the bone. Ice T cells are sensing it and can react on that. Now, if we will talk about bone quality in type 1 diabetes, it's been reported that in type 1 diabetes mellitus patients is six times higher fracture risk if you compare it with healthy individuals. And the quality of the bone is affected on many levels. One of the major features with type 1 diabetes is that there is a lower bone mineral density. This tells you that you have lower mineral, so in general you have lower bone mass. And if you have lower bone mass, you're more suitable for fractures. This is not actually a diabetic fracture. This is my fracture from a few years ago when I fell down from roller skaters. And yeah, I thought that you can nicely see the fracture in here. I broke both my bones in the wrist. It's ulna and radius. And even though that I was healthy, the healing process took some time. It was painful. And for the diabetic patients, the healing process is usually even prolonged. They have more comorbidities, even in the elderly age. So this is with low bone mineral density. Then I show you some bone cells. And they, in the diabetes, have often impaired these processes because you having more resorption. So you are binding more ce uh, cells and bone but you have less of the osteoblasts which are producing new bone. So in the end, you are getting with only resorption, no new bone, which can also lead with for the lower bone mineral density. In type 1, there is lack of insulin, and insulin is an anabolic agent for the bone, so it's also affecting the bone mass. And what is discussed lately quite often in the manner of bone quality and diabetes is accumulation of AGs. AGs is advanced glycation end product because you have high blood glucose. It can affect the structure of the collagen and start to accumulate in the collagen. And when these AGs are accumulating in the collagen fibers, it changes the properties of the collagen. Because normally collagen is something which gives you this bending power. It's a flexible but when you have a lot of ages in the collagen, it's not so flexible anymore. The bone became more brittle, and this means it's more fractures. And my goal or my aim of my PhD project is to characterize the bone microstructure and bone matrix composition with the focus on the advanced glycation end product mineralization and biomechanical properties in type 1 diabetes. There are still a lot of studies from this field which were held on the animal models and we still need to confirm this kind of findings in the human specimens. And luckily I am working with the human specimens which are quite rare so I am treating them with highest respect. I am having human femora, the middle part, here you can see the cross section and I am working with anterior quadrant, which is this part. We are focused in here because there you don't have many muscle attached, so it's more smooth. Yeah, and here this is the quadrant imaged by micro CT. And I said that I am interested on many levels how the diabetes is affecting the bone. So for that reason, I am using different imaging approaches from the classical x-ray in the bone, micro CT. We are using also classical optical microscope for some histology analysis, Raman imaging for acquisition of the AGs, accumulation in the bone, some mechanical testing, and then quantitative backscattered electron imaging. I now would like to mention a bit further. As I said, there is something called bone mineral density. This is information about mineral composition of your bone and practically give you information how much bone mass do you have. 
It's a common for diagnosis for or osteoporosis or fracture risk, but this information don't give you nothing about bone volume or degree of the mineralization because you can have still good bone mineral density, but it doesn't mean that the quality of your bone is good because you can have some hypermineralized part of your bone and the other parts are affected in other way. And that is why we are also using something called bone mineral density distribution, which is assessed by QBI. And this measure the differences in degree of mineralization to be able to do that and quantitatively assess the calcium in the bone specimens, we have to calibrate the back scattered electron signal. And for that, we are using the atomic number contrast of reference materials. For the bone specimens, the references are usually aluminum and carbon. So we know Z of this uh, elements and we create this line, calibration line for that, because we adjust the contrast and brightness of this known element. So we have constant condition and by that we are able to create this line. And from this gray levels, we then have to transfer the gray levels to weighted mean average for the calcium. And for that, they're using standardization line. And we are having like the zero mineralization, which is newly formed bone called osteoid. And then you have percentage of calcium in the pure hydroxide apatite, which are these two lines at the edges. And this technique was confirmed by EDX analysis. And you can see the bone mineralized matrix is sitting on the line between these two like extremes. And from this measurement and evaluation, we are getting histogram. And the histogram is the bone mineral density distribution. And from the histogram, we are able to calculate the calcium mean, which is the most important parameter for us. It gives give us weighted average calcium concentration of the specimen. And basically, we are then comparing our distribution of bone mineral density with the Gaussian distribution. And we are looking at this part, which basically tells you how extreme is your distribution. And you can then statistically play with the data and tells you some additional information. To give you a better picture how the QBI is look like, you can see it in here. This is mouse model of type 2 diabetes mellitus and you can see this like islands which are more brighter and these are the parts where is higher mineralization degree so this technique allows you to even see where are the parts with higher mineralization this is a femur of the mouse here is another one and the sample preparation for qbi for bone specimens it's not so long because we are having a lot of calcium in the bone which is good because it provides for us a really nice contrast so there is no additional staining needed so basically we need to embed the bone specimen into some plastic resin then we have to polish the surface to get this flat image with no artifact and then we put the thin carbon layer to make the specimen conductive into SEM chamber. But yeah, and also you can use heat maps. You can see in here, it's more visible when you use different colors. This is Peja disease. It's also some remodeling disorder. You have higher mineralization in the bone. You can see it also here in the X-ray. And then you can see it nicely on the QBI images, which part and how severe is affected in the patient's bone. And in here, I wanted to show you that backscattered imaging is not only for mineralized tissues, but also for soft tissues and cell. Here is just a comparison. This is a leukocyte image of backscattered taken in 1987. So it's quite old, one of the first images from backscattered imaging. 
and you can see that the resolution is not really good and the authors also were thinking that this method won't be very useful in the future because it's low resolution and not much information. But luckily with the development of detectors and microscopy in general, we are now at this point, which is backscattered images of kidney glomerules from the red. And you can see that you can go and magnify this region with nice contrast. You are still getting information about the composition of your specimen and still nice resolution. Here's another you can image tissue, cells, organelles. It's good to say that to do this kind of images, the sample preparation is a bit longer and you have to work with some uh, heavy metals for staining like osmium, tetroxide or uranyl acetate to create this kind of contrast in the soft tissues. But in the end, I think that the results are pretty amazing. So what I would like you to remember for, from this presentation is that we are getting two signals of electrons in the SEM, which are secondary electrons, and they are providing you topography of your specimen. Then we have backscattered electrons, which gives you some compositional information about your sample. Then I would like you to remember that in diabetes mellitus, we having much more higher fracture risk than in healthy people. And in general diabetes, it's a quite a health challenges for our century. Then, then we have a QBI technique by which we are able to determine the concentration and distribution of calcium and minerals in the bone specimens. And lastly, that backscattered imaging is not only for bone specimens, but you can provide really nice images also of tissue and cell section. And by this last slide, I would like to thank all of my colleagues in Professor Busse lab and our partners, which are providing some finances necessary for this research, which is Heisenberg program and mainly the Fidelio Consortium. And that is all from my side and I am happy to discuss it further with you. Thank you, Thank you Sophie, Sophie, for a nice presentation. And I am opening uh, the, discuss the discussion with, if somebody has some questions, please do not hesitate and ask Sophie.